Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. As you probably have already heard, UGC has decided to discontinue the list of journals that was previously under the one umbrella called UGC Care. And today I am going to dig deep into this particular aspect of publication, how it affects you as a beginner in the journey of academic publications and what it means for academic publications in general. At the end of the video, I'm also going to share with you a very bitter experience of mine in the domain of academic publication with a very reputed publisher. And I will also warn you how to avoid these mistakes that I have made so that you do not make these same mistakes. So let's begin. Now, what was the UGC Care list? UGC Care or the Consortium for Academic Research and Ethics was a list of reputed journals which the UGC found out and singled into a consolidated list. A list which in some cases went on for 50, 60, 70 pages if you consider all streams. Now, this list is not that old. It's, it was launched a few years back, but after its launch, it was adapted with such seriousness and quickness that almost all researchers who wanted to get their works published were running after a UGC care publication. And very soon, it became coterminous with a Scopus indexed publication or a web of science publication. Now, these two indices, Scopus and web of science, have been in the domain of publication for a very, very long period of time. And it is very unfair to compare the UGC care with either Scopus or the web of science. But the fact is, the Indian education system has become so lethargic and so stagnant that whenever something new is introduced which is indianized in one sense then the indian universities do not take long to adapt it into their processes it is also to be mentioned here that there was significant pressure from the ugc to ensure that this list was given the top priority while assessing publications now the fun part is even in its many years of existence UGC Care, and I'm saying this with absolute certainty, UGC Care was never compulsory for anyone. And by anyone, I mean anyone. Be it a person who is applying for a job at the entry level, be it a person who has already received a job and is now applying for a promotion under CAS, or be it someone who is pursuing their PhD and is required to do a publication. In none of these conditions was UGC care a compulsion. There was always an alternative available, be it a Scopus Index publication in Q1 or Q2, be it a publication in a peer-reviewed journal, be it a book chapter. There were always alternatives available. There was not a single opportunity where UGC care was the only option available to any researcher or academic. And this was the only relieving factor that many of us wanted to breathe a sigh of relief about because we have not really cared about UGC care in the last few years. Now, I say that, but what proof do I have? I have over 12 publications in the last I would say five, six years, and not even one of them was UGC care listed. And I have had no problems in my academic career as far as my publications are concerned. I have appeared in multiple interviews for jobs and I have cracked a few of them, one of which I presently pursue. I have appeared in multiple PhD interviews, one of which I have cracked and I'm presently pursuing. In all of these cases, all my publications have been considered for their worth and in none of these interviews have i ever been asked the question why don't you have a publication in a ugc care listed journal 
and I have not only appeared for interviews in West Bengal but also in Delhi. So, so I have never faced a problem when it comes to the UGC KLDS journals publications and I think many of you will also be sharing this experience with me. Now the second thing that I'll be discussing is why was it discontinued? Well, there are many rumors about it, but the primary reason for discontinuing this list was I think that it was becoming too difficult to maintain and update every six months. The list, as I have already mentioned, was enormous and there was no beginning and end to it. There was no sure short way to search this database and many journals which were once UGC care list approved but have been since removed were not properly removed from the website they still mentioned their UGC care list approvals on their respective websites and most importantly it became very difficult for interviewers or recruiters or any evaluators to understand when that person's publication was done under the UGC care list journals at that point of time what journals were included in the UGC care list now, the rule about the UGC KL list was that if your publication was done in the tenure of the journal's acceptance or inclusion in the UGC KL list, then your publication would be considered a UGC KL listed publication. But if it was published after it was delisted or before it got listed, then it would be considered a normal publication from a peer reviewed journal. So, this evaluation category became very difficult for interviewers or recruiters or evaluators to separate and distinct which is I think one of the big reasons why the UGC care list was discontinued. The another main reason why this was discontinued was of the rampant rumors of corruption where it was continuously claimed that many journals paid the committee or the bodies concerned to ensure that their journals got enlisted in the UGC care list and of course, like any other institution, when there is a scope for corruption, there is always the actual existence of corruption. So this was also probably one of the reasons why the UGC care list was discontinued. Now, the third thing which many of you are worried about is what will happen now? Don't worry, UGC has already provided a guideline for journals which they are to follow if they want to keep up their standards. This is a three page document with many many criteria which I am not really going to discuss but I am going to leave the link for that document down in the description section of this video which you can go ahead and read so that you may know what criteria a journal has to follow or are recommended to follow in order to become a journal of quality. And these criteria were almost all of them existed before these criteria were officially declared by the UGC, right? So you don't have anything to worry about. Why? Because all of your publications that were previously in the UGC care, assuming you had some, are still going to count as valid publications, assuming they were done from peer reviewed journals. Now, in most recruitment processes, the only criteria for a journal publication was that it was in a journal that had the blind peer review process ingrained in its structure and this word the double blind peer review or blind peer reviewed journal is the key word that you should be taking into consideration while ensuring which journals to pick while publishing your work. By the way, in one of my very initial videos in the year 2021, which was four years ago, by the way, I had talked about everything that you need to know about publications. And if you are new to my channel, before you go to that video, press the subscribe button down below and the bell icon next to it. And then look upwards, you will find a link to that video. You can go ahead and check that one out so that you may know more about the world of publication, which you need to take seriously if you want to stay and survive and strive in the world of academics. Now, the next thing that people are concerned about is such a huge database is now gone. Where will we find a list of good journals? Now, here is some recommendation from a person who has had some experience in the world of publications. You should always go for journals which are published by educational institutions. This is 
a tip which I had shared in my previous video and I'll continue mentioning this in many many more videos to come that if your journal is published from an educational institute then it is already carrying some sort of integrity and history even if, if the issue is the first one because the educational institute already has a history of several years worthy of being included in the academic sphere and of course another criteria that you should always keep in mind is that these journals that you are publishing your work in should not charge you any kind of fee and by any kind of fee i mean any kind of fee there are several kinds of fees that a journal takes and by the way if you want me to make a detailed video on the topic of what types of predatory practices are executed by journals or book publishers or in some cases editors then please leave the word predatory down in the comments and i'll make a detailed video on that particular topic in my next issue so there are many tricks that these people employ in order to get you to pay the money in some cases it's an article processing fee in some cases it's an open access publication fee in some cases you are not told that you are going to have to pay any kind of fee till the very last minute before the publication is about to happen when you have invested one year one and a half years two years in it and then they are saying that if you don't give us this money we won't publish your work at that point of time you feel helpless and you don't have anything to do and this is exactly what has happened to me in one of my recent publications towards the end of 2023 there was the cfp about posthumanism and i submitted an abstract got selected my full paper was accepted and then the publisher was selected as peter lang now after writing the full paper going through two proofs editing it on multiple occasions on multiple requests of the reviewers and so on and so forth right one month before the publication is about to take place Peter Lang introduced a very weird kind of precondition on our receiving the complimentary copy of the book. They mentioned that we, the contributors of the book, are supposed to buy the book. It's a around 300 page book and the price that we, the contributors who have made the book possible was 1500 rupees after a 40% discount. Now just imagine how much the book is actually worth and why they are taking money from the very people who made the book possible. The fun part is they are not saying that they won't give you a complimentary soft copy. What they are saying is first they will distribute these complimentary hard copies once they are published thereby ensuring that more and more people sign up for these complimentary hard copies which are actually nothing but a practice of a predatory nature where they are asking the contributors to pay 1500 rupees in order to receive a book in which they have a full length chapter and if all the contributors were to say unitedly decide that we don't want this and we would say hypothetically pull out our chapter from this book at this point then Peter Lang would be completely rendered helpless but of course no one did that and I was one of the very few people who actually said that I don't wish to pay the 1500 rupees and receive this copy. Now, the thing is, Peter Lang has been a very reputed publisher in the international market for a very long period of time. If they are resorting to such unethical practices where they are demanding money from their contributors, and I've recently heard in a WhatsApp group, Springer is also doing something similar, though I don't have any personal experience of that, then where will we go as practicing academics who want to get their works published? Well, for starters, you should talk to the editor of your book at the very beginning and say it very clearly that I am not going to pay for my book or my journal. And only if they give you an assurance, then you can go ahead. If the publisher asks the money, you can then hold the editor accountable because the editor is the one who is communicating with the publisher on the behalf of all the contributors and of course you should always get this in writing in an email not even in the whatsapp these are the few steps you can take to ensure that you don't pay any money to get your works published it's always a bad practice and i've been saying this for five years now people have stopped listening to me and to the many other people who have already been saying this for a far longer period than i have and they are now slowly starting to think that it's okay for them to pay even say a small amount like 500 rupees to get access of their work. So I think it's absolutely 
unacceptable and that we as practicing academics should raise our voices against it. So that was it about today's video. If you liked it, please don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe. I'll see you in the next one.